Greetings. Welcome to Appalachian Oddity. I'm your host. In this video, I'm joined by Valerie. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Valerie Riley, and I've been working and studying in the field of cryptozoology for quite some time now. It's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. So we've been in discussion before, back in like 2021, you were part of like a, a round table discussion with some other researchers, and uh, we were talking about yep. organizing and stuff like that. But uh, I've been wanting to do more of like a solo interview with just you and kind of discuss some of your ideas and your perspectives and your research. So I wanted to ask you uh, how you got into the paranormal or what led you to be interested in this subject. Gotcha. Yeah, no. Um, so I actually started pretty young. I started out when I was about four or five. And I actually remember my mom was talking about Bigfoot in passing to, you know, one of her friends. And I, my ears kind of perked up and I was listening to what she was talking about. And, you know, I asked her, obviously, you know, what's that Bigfoot thing that you're talking about? And she kind of gave me a very vague answer, uh, one that is kind of a very normal-based answer. She's like, well, it's this thing that, you know, kind of lives in the woods and everything. And it always kind of stuck with me about what that could have been or what that actually was. Cause I was like, you know, is it real? And she couldn't give me a firm answer on it. So I wanted to find out more about it. And then there'd be times when I would catch a random show on TV about the Loch Ness monster and Bigfoot. And I think the Loch Ness monster is actually the one that piqued my interest the most because I found the idea of a living dinosaur to be absolutely fascinating to me. It was, I was so excited. I was like, what? Are you telling me that there's like an actual like dinosaur that lives in Scotland? Oh my God. So, and I remember like I would try to absorb as much information as I possibly could. I would go to the library and rent out books about the paranormal, about, you know, different kind of weird, unusual sightings, UFOs, ghosts, paranormal. And so I, you know, started to learn more things like the Chupacabra, uh, you know, Bigfoot being seen in different places, the skunk cape. But I think the lock was something that always kind of captured my imagination. Over time, I eventually started reading more about Mothman and was kind of, it was kind of interesting to me, but I was really skeptical on what it was. Uh, and I know that I think my interest became more involved once I learned how close Point Pleasant, West Virginia actually was. And it was something I could actually go to and see it. It was one of the more mainstream stories comparatively to, I think in Virginia, we've got Bunny Man Bridge is something of lore and folktale, uh, which that's kind of like a story that has kind of grown out of this one area. It's a very bizarre story, and it was mostly proven to be false or to be made up, but the guy in a bunny suit, all that weird stuff, but it wasn't as noteworthy as, say, Mothman was. And once I started to learn more about that, and my interest kind of grew into it. And then obviously we all know about the Mothman movie, Mothman Prophecies. And that's kind of when it went more mainstream than it was. My interest kind of peaked more and more to the point where I was going there to visit. And, you know, I was able to actually talk to Linda Scarberry at one point in time while I was in Point Pleasant. And that was very interesting for me and very exciting. And um, yeah, it's just this desire that I have to always continue to find out what things may be, what things could be. And obviously I've got my own thoughts and opinions on everything. But with that being said, I know that I can never definitively say what Linda Scarberry saw that night. I can never do that. I can only make a guess what that is. Um, same thing with the other sightings about the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot. And I think that's kind of like how I 
came in contact with you is, you know, my interest in Mothman and looking up the sites that you were putting up and everything. And it was just really fascinating. And I'm really glad that we were able to have this kind of like interaction and, you know, converse about this type of stuff. So that's kind of my origin story in a, in a nutshell. It's always the, those darn books in the library. I can't tell you how many paranormal investigators or, or researchers are sucked in by, by the books in the library. It's like the, the local legend and, appeal of like, this is close to you and this very interesting story happened. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like a gateway drug. No, uh, it, it's very much, you know, something that I think um, a lot of kids get attracted to just because it's so unique and otherworldly. But I thankfully that there was these authors out there, out there like, you know, John Keel and Lauren Coleman and everything that could kind of cultivate these stories and kind of put them into books and everything. So it was always something that, uh, yeah, I found fascinating. And a lot of libraries have that like paranormal book section where it's like all the books together got like the UFO books and the, the monsters and all that sort of thing just in that section. Sometimes it's in the nonfiction section and you know, sometimes it has its own section. It's, it's like a genre onto itself. It was always kind of interesting to see how big that area would be because normally it was just like one or two shelves. It'd be rare that you would get like a few rows of these types of books, but it was always just always fascinating to see what was. And this was like obviously before the Internet, some of it. So when I would go there, it, I would always have to check out that section to see if there was something new or something interesting that would kind of catch my eye but you know thankfully with the internet it's kind of grown beyond that and uh the story you're saying there of, of the bunny man is interesting because it's kind of like a, a legend that's based on the idea of like a killer as opposed to like an actual like monster or creature you know you, you hear bunny man and you might think there would be something like a mothman or a dogman but it's a very different story it's not a it's not a monster or a creature it's more like like a killer type of guy right and i i think that was one of the local legends, it's up in Clifton, Virginia, where there's this like very unique stone bridge. It, it's almost, it looks like someone took a tunnel and they just sliced it and that's the bridge. And uh, the story goes, for those of you who don't know, is, and there's many different versions of it. So forgive me if I'm not covering all the different versions, but the more widely passed around version seems to be that they were transporting inmates that were inside of ins insane asylums and they were taking them on a train from an older you know compound to a newer one and on that train ride over there they had an accident and some of the inmates escaped and one of them found his way over there at bunny man bridge and it kind of goes into different directions one version of the story says that, you know, he was trying to find things to eat and the only thing he could really find were like rabbits or bunnies and he would kind of like skin them and wear, wear the pelts. Another one is like he actually wore a costume, kind of like a Christmas story kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, he would, uh, you know, eat the bunnies or whatever and like it really becomes popular around Halloween night. They actually have policemen out there now on like October 31st because it's become such a, you know, interesting place to go to around that time. And they say that like, you know, sometimes you can still pass by there and you'll see like little bunny remains being hung from, you know, the bridge and everything, which I'll be honest with you, there's been absolutely no reports of it. There's been no sightings. There's been no pictures. And I know that there was a journalist that actually did look into the story a little bit further. And he said that at no point in time was there actually like any of, there's no records of insane asylums in that area or, you know, even transporting them or even an outbreak because these things usually get recorded if it does happen. And uh, there hasn't been any record of that. So I'm not entirely sure where that legend came from, but it very much is a tale of like folklore and everything. But you're completely right about that is that it does sound something like a, you know, a dog man or a goat man or Bigfoot, something along those lines. But it, it, it's kind of, kind of morphed into its own unique story around here. So that's kind of cool. 
so you first encountered my content with the the Mothman Wiki, and and that's interesting. And then we we met on Twitter in 2020. You joined a group that I set up around that same time, the the Appalachian Mystery Society. Yeah, and um, I know that your wiki actually went into a lot of detail when it came to a lot of the cases, like. A lot of the things that I was looking into were things that you put up. Like you even had notes about the the car that you know Linda Scarberry and the rest of them were in, and I was like, that's fascinating. That's really interesting. I really appreciated the the detail, the attention to detail that you had while kind of doing this. Uh, and admittedly, I don't think that. I've seen a better cataloging of that kind of data. And it's been, you know, I kind of used a lot of what you put up as a little bit of a blueprint for the things that I know. And truth be told, like, I don't think I'd be able to dispense half the information that you've been able to kind of lay the groundwork for. So I'm eternally grateful for that. But it's, uh, you know, and I would also listen to... Um, the other people such as Joe Nickel and um, other investigators doing their own bit. And, um, you know, it's, it's always interesting to hear the different perspectives, but I really did like the, the unbiased view that, that you laid on that, that wiki. And so, yeah, and I, I'm really happy to be a part of the group. And I know that my interests don't quite, you know, lie with everyone else because uh, I'm more on the like monster cryptid area, but you know, there's always these crossovers and you know, it kind of blurs that line. Well, well thank you for, for those kind words. The, the car yeah. they were driving was a 57 Chevy, I should say, black 1957 Chevy. The stuff that was on the Mothman Wiki has for the most part been moved over to the Mothman archive on AppalachianOddity.org. So that's kind of how that went. The way that I was using the Wikia page is not really the way that it's supposed to be. Because people usually use that kind of thing for like a community with a lot of people who are all editing the posts. And I was using it solo as just like making them. And so I was kind of using it like a website. So I basically I decided like, okay, if I'm going to use it like a website, why not just set up a website? And also because Wikia as a platform is, you know, filled with ads these days. So I wanted to have my, my own space to do that sort of thing. So that's why there's Appalachian Oddity. And to also to expand beyond just Mothman to cover all kinds of Appalachian lore and stuff like that. Right. So the, the Appalachian Mystery Society, basically what it was was a, a way to collaborate with people. But what I ultimately realized was that if you want to collaborate with people, you could just collaborate with people. Like, you know, if you, if you want to work on something together, just, just do that. You don't really need a society for collaborating. You can just kind of reach out to researchers and, and collaborate on your own. What the group eventually turned into was like a, a private Discord group, and it, it became rather inactive. So I just said, okay, I'll, I'll just set up a public Discord then. So, so Appalachian Oddity is the new Discord, which is just a public Discord where people can join and talk about anomalous phenomena and folklore and stuff like that. So yes, yeah, so the Appalachian Mystery Society kind of, kind of ran its course. That's pretty much done there. But for the people who were there and stuff, I could still like reach out to them and collaborate with them one-on-one. -on -one. Just networking without having to have a set group is, is basically what I realized I, sh I should be doing, you know. So I wanted to ask you, have you ever had any paranormal experiences? Um, so, no. For the most part, I, I really would love to experience something where I got to see a cryptid. When it comes to other events like UFOs, not something I've ever experienced. I know that I've seen things in the sky, but they're always planes or whatever. I know that I don't want any paranormal activity. I, I think if I had my choice, I would most certainly pick something that I would have a bit more control of, like, you know, seeing a cryptid. And meaning the control comes from like being able to get away from the situation where I know some people re who report ghostly activities, they say that they can't get away from it or they can't escape it. Like they've even moved house and they, they still can't get away from it. That, that stuff to me is very unnerving, but um, I know that like a paranormal event or something would be something that I, I, I would be interested in having. I It's not one of those things where you can just say, hey, let's do this and let, let's get it rocking and rolling. It's just one of those things that it just has to be at the right time and moment and place. So you messaged me about uh, an idea you had about a cryptozoology nonprofit. So could you explain that sort of thing, that idea? 
it's been something that I've been looking into for a while uh, and just trying to draw it out. And I think now is the time to kind of come to the forefront of it and uh, kind of present it and start talking about it more often. Uh, it's something that I've been kind of looking at from different angles and where I wanted to attack this. So I think at the forefront is that I would like to try to start an association that is more on the scientific side and the credibility side, uh, and that's where we would actually get our name from, called the CRED Association for Cryptozoology Research, Education, and Discovery. And it's pretty exciting. I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, it's still in the process, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's something that I'm glad that I reached out to you and just kind of welcome feedback from all different angles. Yeah, I thought this was a, an interesting or, or compelling project there. I like the wordplay of the name. Of course, I'm not a cryptozoologist. I'm more of a fan of folklore and stuff like that. But I, at least I can relate to the idea of documenting odd stories and anomalies. I found that to be fundamental and important. So could, could you talk about that, how, how your organization or how your, your nonprofit would, would go about like data and sightings? Sure. Yeah, of course. So we'd start off with the mission statement of the association. Currently, uh, the mission statement is to advance cryptozoological research through rigorous scientific methods, seeking to explore and document the existence of these cryptids and contribute to the broader scientific understanding of undiscovered species. You may or may not know the thylacane, for example, was a creature that was kind of hunted into extinction and has now fallen into the realms of cryptozoology because there are sightings of it. We know that it was a real animal at one point in time, and there's still a little bit like murmurs and everything that it's still there, but we don't know if it actually still exists. We've got some footage, some pictures and everything. Uh, same thing with the coelacanth is that that's an animal of cryptozoology where we know it's a real animal because it was found, it was discovered off the coast of Madagascar. And it's something that we still continuously look for and we try to research and everything, but it's still, we just can't seem to find another one because it's very difficult. Okay, so this is where I think we have to get into the, the concept of a cryptid and what, what is a cryptid and what you consider a cryptid. So could you talk about that word? Yeah, a cryptid is essentially a word that means uh, like a hidden, like crypt is, I think, I believe it's Latin for hidden. Mm -hmm. And then cryptid is just a hidden type of animal. So cryptozoology is the the study of hidden animals, hidden species, or what have you. Um, you know, there's obviously things in there that include Bigfoot, that include Mothman, that include Loch Ness Monster. Those are the well-known topics that, you know, everyone has, like, has a story or has a thought, a process of, you know, what they go about it. And, uh, but then you've got the lesser known or ones that aren't as prevalent. You know, even the Komodo dragon was an animal that was thought to just be fairy tale or lore that eventually was discovered. So you do have these animals that get discovered. Once they're discovered, they're documented, they're researched or looked into. And essentially, that's what I'd like to really bring to the table with, you know, putting the real scientific mind, the real thought process, and getting that into motion to help fund and research and discover these new creatures. And that would be a part of the goals and objectives, such as conducting field research to gather empirical data on reported cryptids, applying DNA analysis, environmental monitoring, and other scientific techniques to validate or debunk cryptozoological claims. Also, along with collaborating with established scientists and academic institutions to ensure credibility and peer review of research findings, equip and educate 
any agents or any people who wish to go out on these endeavors and do this research on their own or, you know, be a part of the association and try to get out there to do more research, more field work. Okay. Well, one thing about cryptozoology, as I said, I am not a cryptozoologist. I'm more of a folklore fan and a Fortean. There is a bit of overlap or history there between Fortians and cryptozoology because uh, Ivan T. Sanderson, who was a part of the original Fortean society, he is the one who coined the term cryptozoology back in uh, the late 1940s. He had articles in the Saturday Evening Post, the first one being Don't Scoff at Sea Serpents in March of 1947, and then the other one is There Could Be Dinosaurs in January of 1948. He coined the term cryptozoology. And he did, uh, you know, like research in the way that like a Fortean does, where they assemble stories and collect sightings and data from old newspapers and, you know, uh, like you know, the original Charles Fort, who used to go to the library and collect stuff from medical journals and stuff like that. Ivan T. Sanderson was a big fan of Charles Fort, and, you know, they were uh, contemporaries. The thing about that is, you know, also being a zoologist, he kind of applied some of the ideas of Charles Fort to the field of zoology and, you know, start studying sea serpents and uh, potential living dinosaurs. And so that's kind of where that whole term or concept comes from, you know, or it was uh, cemented there with Ivan T. Sanderson and eventually inspired uh, Bernard Hovelman. Um, but I guess I don't really, I, I have criticisms of, of cryptozoology and I don't really agree with the preconceived notions there. Uh, the main one being the idea that all of these things are necessarily like, undiscovered animals, you know, which is seems to be that the big thing of zoology is that all of these different things are, you know, seen automatically almost as undiscovered animals. Right. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of these animals, they can fall into obscurity. They can also be, you know, brought back up and they could honestly be out there. And it's just essentially framework, if you will, to kind of bring more awareness to cryptozoology, make people more aware of things that are going on, and to be a little bit more critical when it comes to the sightings or anything that were to happen. Because we've got a lot of people that, you know, see Bigfoot or their sightings of Bigfoot, Yahweh, Yaren, whatever. <laughs> and to try to encapsulate all these sightings and try to get more information because you know there's always people that are going to make up stories or they it's a misidentification or it's a bear with mange something of that nature you know can kind of skew the idea you know and it i feel so that there's this idea that people have when people start talking about cryptozoology and they start thinking that it's for you know a crackpot or someone who you know isn't isn't all there or something however with that being said there could be valid truth to whatever the stories these people are bringing to the table now if you don't mind me asking, what, what criticisms do you happen to have about it? And mind you, I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a skeptic at heart, and I love the open discussion. And, you know, that's a little bit of something else is that having to understand the empathy that comes with these stories, because sometimes it's a little bit more personal in nature or, you know, whatever – it may be it our mission isn't to go out to debunk everything it's to investigate and to research but i'd love to hear like what what criticisms you may have on those topics oh, okay so yeah i i appreciate your skepticism and that sort of thing that that's very good we, we've talked about this sort of thing before you're you're very of, of the skeptical mindset and and i appreciate that kind of thing um but a groundwork layout first is i guess like what a fortian is and uh, that goes back to Charles Fort, who was an author in, in New York who wrote from 1919 to 1932. And the books that he wrote were collected anomalies. So he would spend his time in the New York Public Library and then later in the, the British Library. He would collect stories of, like from newspapers and medical journals of things that were odd or mysterious. 
and you know like things falling from the sky famously frogs and fish falling from the sky just all kinds of strange things that he thought that you know science couldn't explain mysterious lights in the sky which later kind of came what we, what we know today as ufos or unidentified flying objects he would collect anomalies and some of them were uh, you could call them zoological such as like you know lake monsters or he talked about the Jersey Devil, which was, you know, like, uh, it's such an old story that even back then he knew about it. But yeah, he just kind of assembled these odd reports, things like ball lightning, uh, spontaneous human combustion, uh, all kinds of odd things. And he just collected them for the world to see, and he called them the procession of the damned, that this data would, would march through the street. Uh, they, people would read them, and they, they would march. Oftentimes, what he was simply doing was uh, being rather spiteful towards science, because he was very critical of authority of any kind. So he was basically saying, like, here's a bunch of things that science can't explain. Here's a bunch of things that, you know, are unknown. And what he kind of laid out was this groundwork of the anomalous phenomena, the, the mysterious, kind of what we think of today as the paranormal. It's kind of carved out by Fort and later the people who followed him who called themselves Fortians. And, you know, he would sometimes come up with theories or little ideas about these things, ways of explaining them. Like, oh, well, maybe these missing items and these random appearing items, maybe they're connected and it's some kind of... Uh, he coined the term teleportation. But of course, these were tongue-in-cheek, almost satirical ideas, almost like poking fun at science for not being able to uh, describe it or explain it, saying, here's an idea that's just as good or just, just as likely. Um, but yeah, so that, that's kind of what the whole Fortean thing is. And this is what inspired Ivan Sanderson to apply to, to zoology. So he's basically looking around at the field of zoology and seeing things and saying, here's some things that science can't explain in the zoological field. And, you know, Ivan Sanderson was a, a real, you know, actual has a degree as a as a zoologist and he he would do like tv spots he would do like tv things where he would come on there with animals for tv show hosts he was one of those guys i didn't know that that that's actually pretty interesting mm -hmm. yeah it's cool and he he would um you know he was like a, a world traveler he would travel around and he wrote about stuff and he said that he saw a cave demon of, of local african lore while in north africa it was like a very large bat and so he wrote about his, his journeys and about, wrote about nature. And then, like I said, in, in the 40s, late, late 40s, he started writing more Fortean stuff and more zoological anomalies and sea serpents and living dinosaurs and, and that sort of thing. You know, and that kind of thing became pretty popular, especially after King Kong with all the living dinosaurs in King Kong. People kind of, a lot of ideas about living dinosaurs really picked up around that time. So, yeah, so there's that connection there. And I guess the point I'm saying is that I like the idea of collecting stories. And I like what uh, what Charles Ford did and what the Fortians later did. And Ivan Sanderson's pretty cool. But when you start saying that, you know, like, by definition, these things are, like, when you start calling them cryptids, you're kind of saying, by definition, these things must be undiscovered animals. And, you know, I guess I also, because I like folklore, it's another thing I should get into, is folklorists, they also collect stories. And they understand that the stories are oftentimes just narrative, just storytelling. Uh, sometimes with truth behind them, oftentimes with no truth behind them. And so I like storytelling, and I like stories, and I like hearing about anomalies or weird things. Someone sees a Sasquatch, someone sees a UFO, someone sees, you know, who knows what. I like those stories, I like the collecting of that story, I like the kind of the oddity of them, the strangeness of them, like with Sasquatch. I, I could read stories about Sasquatch all day, but the idea that it must be some undiscovered species of ape, or it's Gigantopithecus, or it's some kind of uh, relic hominid, uh, those ideas I'm, I'm very skeptical of. I don't. I think that the documentation of the stories is important for a folkloric reason and even for a Fortean reason, but those kinds of ideas I don't agree with, which is why I don't consider myself a cryptozoologist. Sure. No, that's completely understandable, and I totally agree where you're coming from. I think what I am trying to kind of present is not only collect stories, but also to try and go more in depth with, try to figure out what is part of the story, what is part of reality. And I understand that there's always that gray zone where it's going to be questionable to a degree. Uh, and essentially what I'm hoping that we can do is at least try to discover new creatures or entities, whether, you know, and like I said, is that some of it has to deal with lore. And we want to make a clear definition is that the lore is completely a part of it. But 
to try and ground things in reality and try to see what specific entities are going to actually be a biological by nature uh, and figure out what these entities actually are. Uh, so part of it would be like the education and awareness and try to educate people on these topics and just have education initiatives to raise public awareness about cryptozoology and the research, you know, what is lore, what is fantasy, what is reality, and try to kind of bring everything back to a more biological state to, you know, have something living in front of you and say, yes, that's a, that's a new creature. And you're right. It does get kind of messy at times, especially when there's so many interwoven ideas of, I guess, fantasy, fantastic, whatever kind of happenings. I think the idea is to just try to have something at the end of the day to say, yeah, that's a real living uh, you know, entity. That's a real animal. And not everything falls under cryptozoology, obviously, but... Uh, the idea of trying to have this research and this discussion about what's real, what's not real, and the things that would kind of fall under the cryptozoology umbrella. Because I think we can kind of agree that it can be nebulous, especially once you start putting in ideas of demons. Like, is that a cryptozoology animal? I would personally say no. But, it, you know, because I can't confirm it's real or not real, you know, is an alien or a gray, is that a cryptid? Is that a cryptid? I, again, no, because I don't think it's an animal that would fall under a different purview of discussion, I feel. What if someone just outright said, I think that the stories are important for like cultural reasons, and I'll interview a witness, I'll take the story but I don't believe in Sasquatch and I don't think they're real. Would that person be allowed to join your group? Of course. As long as there's an interest there to gather this information, here's my perspective, and this may be tainting it a little bit, but like I said, is that I stand by the skeptic side. I have a deep enthusiasm about this topic, about this type of research because I find it so fascinating. And that's actually kind of my perspective is that I have a hard time assigning belief to anything that I can't actually prove 100%. But I'm at no point going to ever say that, you know, what a person saw or they didn't see to be incorrect or, you know, not factual at all. Like court of law type of stuff. It would be in the same vein where things are not true unless proven otherwise. And there's, I know that there's people on both sides of the fence that you've got hardcore believers that, you know, 110% believe, know for a fact that the Sasquatch is real and they can prove it. And then there's people like myself that, you know, I look at the Patterson Gimlin film. And does it prove it one way or another? No, not definitively, because as we all know, that's been hotly debated over years and years of years of research and looking into it, re replicating it, stabilizing it, cleaning up the footage. All this kind of research gets poured into it, but it has yet to be fallen on either side of that fence. And that's kind of what I hope to cultivate here is this discussion, this topic, this trying to get to the bare bones of everything and try to understand what is actually going on here and to see if we can actually discover something new. That's cool. So if you, if you say that people who don't believe can still join to collect the stories and, you know, think that it's an important subject, then that's cool. Then, you know, that's something that I could, could work with. I think I still have my reservations though about certain things, of course, you know, uh, for example, the, the term cryptozoology and the term cryptid, I, I tend to, to, to not like those terms because, you know, I feel like when you say something's a cryptid, it's kind of like a, you know, like a preconceived notion, like you're kind of assuming 
the that it must be an undiscovered animal. It's like kind of starting with the conclusion and working backwards. I, I can certainly see where you come from on on that, and that's that's understandable. Uh, I feel so that when it comes to any kind of biological entity, you have to start somewhere, and it may you're right. It may not be the right place to start. But once we start to open that discussion and try to figure out more of what it is, and is it in this field of study, is it in that field field of study? But it kind of starts with a with a initial discussion of what it is and what's going on. So I, I agree with you. It has to start somewhere. It may not be right to classify it as a cryptid to begin with. However, there you know it's kind of like the first seed in the garden. We we won't know until we kind of plant it and see what grows out. Well, I, I just view it as kind of like a like a loaded term. If I was going to do like organizing around this sort of thing, I, I think I would probably approach it more like a folklorist. Or, of course, you know, since I have a, a wide range of, of studies and interests, I would include all kinds of things. So I would just kind of like go for the general anomalous phenomena. But you're focusing very specifically on, you know, reports of, of monsters and, and strange creatures. If I was going to like this, I think I would just call it monster, creature... I wouldn't use like something that seems like an ideologically loaded term like cryptid, you know? Sure. Well, and I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. Ever since I was younger, I, I once you look into like cryptozoology, like Bigfoot, for instance, and I remember looking into like the early days of the internet and you start looking into it and then it kind of branches off really quick because you start looking at bigfoot and then you start looking at aliens and then you start looking up ghosts and then you look at up de demonic activities and it, it kind of grows exponentially from that point and i i mean I, i'm going to be honest here is that uh i i i tend to like cryptozoology and the the creatures that that fall under it because it's kind of like almost a little bit of a safety. I, 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 while I say I'm a skeptic, I'm going to be honest, ghosts kind of scare me. Like, I know that I wouldn't ever want to come face to face with a ghost. And I think that's why I personally kind of gravitate more to something that I can tangibly explain or tangibly, you know, prove or something of that nature is I don't know if ghosts ever could or would be definitively shown proof of it could be i you know i'm not sure that's not my field but something that like we can produce a body or something that we actually tangibly have like the coelacanth that is something that's easy to show and prove and also I, it's a lot less scary like <laughs> possession and things like that that that's where it gets kind of freaky you said before that you were looking for things that are living in front of you, as, as you said. I'm, I'm more interested in stories and, and storytelling and, and folklore. I think you said before that you wanted to have uh, field agents in this, uh, this nonprofit organization you're setting up here. Could, could you describe that concept and how that would work? Sure, yeah, and this is actually building on something that you kind of brought to the table in our previous discussions, because one of the ideas that you said that you wish that there was kind of like a database to collect all this kind of information, these mm -hmm. stories, these reports into one big bank of information. Mm -hmm. And that's something I would very much like to have as well to have field agents that are interested in this kind of research to go out and interview the person or communicate with the person through phone call through and, mm -hmm. you know, record sitting down with that person and recording it and to try and figure out like what the story is, what happened. Then from that point, we would do our best to be non judgmental because that is something that I also kind of want to reiterate is that I feel as though a lot of people think that skeptics and believers are always at odds with each other. And I really don't like that. I, I feel as though that we are on the same team is we're doing what we do to research and to look into this. And I feel as though that the more that we try to learn from other people, the more that we try to gather this information, it's going to help us see what we can do in order to take that as a footprint of a story and try to replicate it or see what different type of actions that we can do to try to either discover more 
about this creature or to look into it further. And I feel as though that we could give it a cred score, a cred rating, if you will. And it was something that we would pull behind closed doors and not, you know, go up and be combative with people because they would be giving us their reported information. As far as we know, it's real for them. No matter what happened, it's, that's their reality. And, but when we pull it back and we try to look into it further, we're going to want to see what is fact, what can we actually reproduce, what are other people saying, and base it on that. With the whole interviewing witnesses thing, it'd, it'd be great if you had, uh, as you said, field agents who were like trained in how to ask like non-leading questions, how to be objective and impartial and, and, and collect data and, and that sort of thing, maybe in you know, some formalized way or something. You know, just people who are, are good at doing basically what a, what a folklorist would do, which is going to, to someone and you know, getting down their story and, and that sort of thing. And then also, if you know, if you're talking about a cryptozoology organization, you also have field agents who are, you know, doing the whole Bigfoot footprint, plaster cast, that kind of work as well. And, you know, could do both, can wear both hats, go interview a witness and get all the details down and then go out looking for the location and going over the location and looking for footprints or something like that. Trained and kind of educated on all that sort of thing. That, that would be very cool if you had like a, a team of people who were like that, who reported back to your organization. Yeah, and that's something that we would like to really encourage is to have more people do this kind of work. And it's kind of in a weird way, like a hunting license almost, is that, you know, people go out because they enjoy that sport or whatever, what have you. And if we were to kind of pull it into a different, more educational based system where they could go out and do that type of research because they find it interesting. They find it engaging and try to get that information and to put it in, you know, keep it as like a data bank and try to figure out what can we pull out of these stories. It really is kind of surprising to me that there hasn't been more education and awareness when it comes to this type of research, just because I feel as though that educational initiatives to raise, you know, awareness about this would be really helpful and really engaging for society, especially when it comes to these different topics. And, you know, it can always involve workshops, lectures, and outreach programs. It, it I mean, to me, it gets me excited. I don't know about anyone else, but it sounds <laughs> fascinating to me. I've seen Sasquatch researchers and, and people who study that sort of thing. And some of them are very good with being impartial and kind of objective and just, you know, letting the witness speak and taking down the story. And they, they kind of are like amateur folklorists, which is, which is good. Um, but sometimes there are people who their, their questions aren't open-ended enough because you have to ask very open-ended questions. You can't be like leading the witness. So for, for like example, you go up to someone and you say, uh, you saw a Sasquatch, its fur was brown, wasn't it? That's like a leading question. If you say, or what was the coloration? That's a, a better question. So that kind of thing, just simple stuff like that, like being aware of that and, and sort of not tainting the witness with like a bunch of preconceived notions or like other ideas. Like don't go up to a witness and say, oh, there's 20 Sasquatch sightings in this area. And let me tell you all about them. You know, like don't do that sort of thing. Or, oh, did it, did it look like this? And hold up some drawing that someone else made or some other case or some you know blurry Sasquatch photo or or try to bring out a like a call sound from some other case, you know, not not uh, contaminating the witness with other information and just kind of letting them tell their own story and, and speak their own mind and you know just being uh, non-leading and also being impartial, you know, like not sitting there trying to debate with them what they saw, but just letting them tell the story. Right. Not you know, because the time for skepticism is like you know later, not during the interview. You just kind of ask them, of course, and kind of get yeah. the the details out there. So yeah, if we had um, like a lot of field agents who were trained in that sort of thing. That, that, would, that would be very cool. Um, there have been organizations like this in the, in the past, but this one is interesting because it is a, supposed to be a, a nonprofit, so that, that's a, a cool addition there. Right, yeah, and that's something that I've kind of been looking at for a little while is that I've been – I mean, we've got associations for just about everything under the sun except this part right here, and it, that's kind of what is surprising to me is that um, – 
you know, it really hasn't been done before, and it's something that I'm, you know, continuously looking into, working on, and trying to figure out all the little nooks and crannies that kind of fall under this umbrella. Um, and you're exactly right. You know, there's a way that you can kind of interview people and, you know, try to lead the person to certain conclusions, and that's not what we want to do. That's not the mindset that I have is that we want to gather their unbiased story, essentially untainted story, and, you know, kind of pull that back into the organization and look at the real data. Uh, I think that's what, to me, is the most interesting part of it is because we have these sightings, we have these encounters, we have these stories that paint a really unique picture, their story, their encounter is theirs and theirs alone. We're not there to judge it. We want to just be informational about it and try to kind of condense it and, I guess, boil out all the impurities and try to figure it out from that point. So I don't know much about nonprofits or how that works or, or any of that works really but i know a little bit about paranormal history and 40 organizations and i know that there was the society for the investigation of the unexplained or s-i-t-u uh, which sanderson set up in 1965 and it ran until the 80s of course sanderson died in 73 but it continued on after his death until the 80s and it was a, a general 40 in organization but with Sanderson at the helm, it uh, focused, I'm sure, on cryptozoology a bunch. And then afterwards, there was the International Society of Cryptozoology, or the ISC, founded in 1982. And that one is where the term cryptid was coined from. It was coined in the newsletter in 1983. So that one continued for a while and ended in 1998. So that's probably one of the biggest well-known and famous cryptozoology organizations. Yeah, no, and while doing this research, I did stumble upon some of those that you were talking about. Yeah, it just doesn't seem like that there's anything today, anything current. And that's kind of like what the goal would be is to bring this back to try to reinvigorate, you know, people who like to do this research or want to do this research and try to use these investigative tactics to get more stories, more kind of information. One of the things I know that I would really like to do is to collaborate with experts. I want to put a huge emphasis on commitment to collaboration with established scientists, researchers, institutions, and related fields. We would want to have partnerships with you know, the esteemed research and institutions all around the country and work with colleges, work with different professors, work with, you know, laboratories, and have these kinds of relations to try and develop these methods to always and continuously find more, research more, and to just discover more. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, you mentioned there are already a lot of, like, small, local Sasquatch-seeking groups all around America. You can find small groups of people who sometimes interview witnesses, sometimes just go out in the woods looking for Sasquatch or trying to have an encounter of their own. I know that probably the first Sasquatch-seeking group was Roger Patterson's Abominable Snowman of America Club in 1966. So that, that's something that already exists, but like a, a big organization or, or a nonprofit, yeah, I, I don't think that something like that exists currently. Right. And that actually touches on something else. We do have, you know, these other groups, these other researchers out there that they kind of have their own goals in mind of how they want to proceed once they see this creature or this entity and what they would do once they find it, once they stumble upon it. That's one of the bullet points that I have created would be the ethical treatment of cryptids is that if applicable, address the ethical considerations regarding the treatment of these cryptids, emphasizing humane and ethical practices with 
in the pursuit of this knowledge. You know, if we do stumble upon something that is unknown, let's not kill it. <laughs> you know, and we, we want to say that that's, you know, obviously, but there's some people that are just have a, a trigger response to things. And if we start to enrich people with this knowledge to have the right reaction in that moment in time, I feel as though that it could preserve any life that people would come across or anything else. Mm -hmm. Yes. In, in the Sasquatch community, there is a, a the big debate of pro kill versus no kill. And, uh, you know, I say that if such things existed, of course, I would be team no kill. So I, I would agree with you there. Mm -hmm. And uh, if such creatures existed, you know, I would think there would be DNA. But, of course, that's never happened, uh, which, you know, goes more to my, my rather folkloric view. But, yeah, during outbreaks of, like, monster mania, you, you saw this with even the Mothman, people often, you know, grab their guns, go and looking for the creature. Um, so that, that is a, a thing that happens, you know, like, kind of like the, the hunt for Frankenstein's monster. When there are sightings in right. a small town of, of a Sasquatch like that, that does tend to happen. Uh, and there's a report I have here about a, a park ranger in a small town, like a small town official said, if it's not in the hunter's game book, it's illegal. So people could say that if, if you did kill a Sasquatch, it would be illegal. So there, there's that. Sasquatch has law on his side. Yeah. yeah, and the, you know, I, I feel as though that, you know, you're, you're exactly right when there's like one sighting to kind of have these other other, you know, smaller sightings or different sightings across the town or flaps as they call it, I find that to be really interesting. And yeah, there undoubtedly are people that just have this response of like, well, I'm going to go make sure that it doesn't terrorize me or my kids at 3 a.m. And most of the time, that's not the case. <laughs> and I, I really feel as though that Using an outreach program or uh, this association would help people have a better understanding, best case reaction when something like this does arise is that, you know, we would have a flap and then people would use the materials that we would provide as kind of a template to how to proceed and what to do from that point on. That's one other thing I'd really like to bring to the organization would be transparency of everything that would be going on and just having everything be open data, like a mm -hmm. pledge to operate transparently, share research findings openly, uh, you know, and it would help build trust with the scientific community and the public through, you know, funding and support and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tra transparency would be good. If you had like an open and accessible database for the public, that'd, that'd be really cool. One thing that you mentioned before is education. You, you want to educate people on this sort of thing. So can you explain like what you mean by that, how you're going to educate people or in, in what way? Sure. So I, I feel as though that the education would come from other researchers or trying to build a framework of one of how we go about trying to interview people, how like you said, we don't want to lead people down a certain path, operate correctly when it comes to talking to these witnesses, uh, education when it comes to where exactly have these creatures been sighted, what was that person doing, maybe they were doing something that attracted the creature, or what bait did they put out in order to try to see if they could get it on a trail cam. Things like that would help I, I feel as though it would enrich the in communities that like to go out and do this kind of research. I would really want it to generate more interest from the public and scientific institutions to try and help fund or have more people interested to go out and look for these things or to research them. Yeah, pe people with more uh, journalistic training or even you know, citizen journalists who know how to approach that kind of thing for not only collecting the data, but presenting it and all that sort of thing. Yeah, that, that would be cool. The theories come and go, but the data, if preserved, is forever. So that's, that's the part that matters to me and that crosses that, that barrier between like all the different studies, I think, that in all the 40 and anomalous phenomena things. It, you know, if they might have different theories about what these things could be, like if you, some people who think that these are, are flesh and blood biological animals, 
and some people in the UFO field who think that those are extraterrestrials or something like that. If the, the data is presented unbiasedly and it's collected properly, then regardless of what their theories are, regardless of if they say that these are, are men from Mars or whatever, it, does, it doesn't really matter as long as the, the sighting of the, the light that was seen in the sky is, is recorded accurately and is there for future generations to marvel at and have their own theories and ideas about. But the theories aren't the big part. That's, you know, that's the, the secondary part in, in my mind. The, the data is the important part. Yeah, and I feel as though that these firsthand witnesses and these stories that people have are vital to potential discoveries. So I, I completely agree with you. And that's, you know, really what it's about. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, data, 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 can't make bricks without clay. So you, you collect the data and then you can extrapolate from it and theorize about it and come up with ideas from it. But the, the collecting of the data is the important part. And that's the more folkloric part, the, the part that the folklorists do. And, you know, kind of what, what Charles Fort did with the collecting of the data. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I will say is that, like, me personally, when it comes to my background, I've got a background in science and technology and everything, so... And you are a computer whiz. I, I, I do my best. I, I'm not going <laughs> to... I mean, I was building my own circuits at the age of, you know, six and things of that nature. So it, uh, you know, it, it's kind of... I feel as though that it's given me a very strong jumping point, especially when it comes to, you know... If you do this, then this will happen. Kind of help me when it comes to putting some of this information, this organization together to try and, you know, move forward from that point. What do we store that data on? Once we collect it, what do we do from it from that point and everything else? So, so there was a there was a researcher who was uh, focused primarily on uh, UFOs, and he was part of the Center for UFO Studies or or CUFOS. Uh, David Webb, and he created this thing called the Humanoid Catalog, or the HUMCAT, and this was back in the 1970s. And it's a very interesting sort of thing. It kind of goes down to the basic journalistic idea of who, what, when, where, why kind of thing. It gives you the name of the witness, and then the date the sighting occurred, and then kind of like a, a brief overview of the story, kind of like a summary, and then it gives you uh, the sources, like where the, the sighting came from. And so that's the kind of like the, the format that he has, the, like the, the standard format where all of them have that kind of uniform look to them and it's really cool for for that kind of thing to have like a bunch of sightings that all have that same uniform kind of like data sheet style to them there was a, a Fordian researcher in the 2010s albert rosales who created a book series called the humanoid encounter book series and he kind of took the humcat and expanded it he took all the data there and then added more and more and kind of just built it up you know maintaining that same kind of formatting and so there have been, you know, examples of people trying to build databases before. Of course, that's more UFO oriented or more general paranormal centric uh, overall stuff. They have a lot of, you know, as it says, humanoid encounters. But something like that with monsters and creatures and, and Sasquatch and that sort of thing would be really cool. And I think it's a, a common wish among modern para-researchers that we have like a big database. You know, ever since we've had computers and stuff like that, people have dreamed about that kind of thing. And even beforehand, people tried to assemble these big databases in, in ink and paper. So so yeah, that's a fascinating thing that has, has long been something that I've been aiming for or interested in. And you know, on my on my website, Appalachian Oddity, I kind of have something similar to that. I have my own database of like Mothman sightings, Mothman archive, and I add more and more stuff that I come across and that I can, you know, uh, reduce down and summarize into data sheets. And so I, I cover, you know, monsters and, and UFOs and all that sort of thing. But yeah, it's the same kind of formatting of the who, what, when, where, why kind of thing. And so if you were going to do things like that, it'd be cool if you had, you know, a, an open and accessible database that had that kind of, or some kind of formatting, un uniform formatting that people could, could draw from. And as you said, with transparent people could look into and that people could kind of add to their pool of data and of material. Yeah. Yeah, I feel as though that those are great starting points when it comes to the who, what, when, where, why type of format, uh, but also being able to have almost like an open platform, like a wiki, something like that really does help, but that kind of engenders the question of, well, how legitimate is it? Like I said, that's something that I would really like to kind of push that idea to have like a, a cred rating on it 
the cred rating would just be how credible are the sources, how credible is the person who collected that information, how credible is the story, how credible everything is. And I understand that that's a very nebulous idea where it's hard to determine what is credible, what is incredible. Was this a second, third, fourth hand story? Was this a story that was passed down through family to family? Or was it a first-hand sighting? What mm -hmm. evidence, if any, do they have that they can bring to the table? What information and what evidence can we collect at this point? And if you say that your friend Jim can back you up, let's go interview that individual and try to find out what their story is and what they saw, what evidence they can provide, if any, any pictures, video, sound recordings, anything, and then trying to give it a cred rating at that point. And mind you, I wouldn't want the cred rating to be the, you know, the thing that we die on the sword by, because <laughs> they would be, you know, nebulous or guessing at best, but it's something that would kind of help mitigate. That's an interesting idea. The, the first thing that, that came to mind, uh, as you said, is like, well, how, how do you determine credibility and how do you determine that sort of thing? But yeah, what you said there about like firsthand or secondhand, that's that's something that's like a good start. At least you could say that uh, a firsthand sighting is, is, you know, more credible than a second or thirdhand sighting. I can see what you're saying there. Once you get beyond that, if you're talking about multiple different firsthand sightings, it does kind of become, as you say, nebulous or kind of arbitrary as to what's more credible. If multiple people all saw a creature you could say that's more credible than one person seeing the creature because they could be mistaken or they could uh, there could be uh, other factors that, that tie in like mental illness and things like that but if multiple people see it then it couldn't be uh, you know it's less likely to be hallucination you know it could still be deception or even be multiple people misidentifying the same thing but i could see that you say that could be perhaps more credible but yeah it is it is kind of subjective and as you say nebulous and kind of building from that kind of the idea that it's a movie rating in a sense because we all have different thoughts and feelings of what's a good bad movie or anything else but the star system doesn't indicate whether it definitively is a great movie or a bad movie it's still a movie it's still a report it's still a sighting heavily emphasize that it is not an indicator that it's a real event or a fake event mm -hmm. Yeah, that is that is an interesting idea. I think of like the Scarberry and Mallet sighting, the the original November fifteenth, nineteen sixty six Mothman sighting, and I think about that one like, well, what would its rating be considering it's uh it's four witnesses claiming to see the, this creature, and they have police reports, and the police reports were all you know given separately. You know, the, the teenagers were separated when they gave their police reports, so that's you know something to add in there that would be maybe boost its credibility rating a little bit. I don't know if you'd factor in like the, the legacy or the age of the, the story or how much it was printed in the newspaper to, to show that this did uh, claim this, you know, that, that sort of thing, as opposed to something that, like you found in a blog somewhere where you probably have a super low credibility rating. So yeah, that's an interesting, interesting idea, looking at those different factors and determining like an actual rating system. Right. And I, I feel as though that's something that could actually impact the, the cred score is how consistent the person that were first reported it how consistent their story stays over time. One thing that Linda Scarberry, and I, I remember this, is in her first report, she stated the entity did not have arms. Mm -hmm. She stated that in the police report. Yep. Then later on, she eventually got to a point where you know, she recalls seeing the, the veins that were inside the arms. Mind you, I would be a person that is going to say, okay, well, that has changed over time. That doesn't match the description. So it would lower the, the cred report a little bit. But again, there'd be many different factors to it. It would just be, a, you know, a hit. Or And there's also other times where it could increase the cred score. Maybe that they said that they saw it in the woods and it left this footprint. We then later went out and got a cast of it, and that would increase the cred score. So it would be almost like a living credibility rating that these stories could have attached to them. Yeah, if you, if you could do that sort of thing and do it systematically, I think it would be super interesting. Uh, another factor you could think about is like, you know, if someone's a, a lifelong witness and their story is consistent the whole way through, you could say that that person has a higher cred rating than someone who recently saw something 
in 2019 and their their story hasn't played out all the way yet because you know maybe they later could be proven to to be a hoaxer or be, be debunked in some way or they could recant their story or something like that but someone who like was a lifelong witness and consistent and told the story the same way every time you know that that could right. be a, a factor so yeah i think that's interesting to try to look at that in a, a systematic way i i have seen people's stories kind of warp over time and that may be due to how the person actually is how well they remember things how you mm. know because w one day you know jim said he caught a fish and it was you know <laughs> a, a three pounder and then you know before you know it it weighed 18 pounds so it, it's mm. kind of one of those those things where we would have to take into consideration you know time age and reliability but i i feel as though that it's important to focus too that it's not something that we would live or die by mm -hmm. yes indeed and uh memories aren't set in stone memory degrades yep. over time and even true stories warp over time because when you remember something you're kind of remembering the last time you told it and yeah, if you spend enough time looking at anomalous phenomena and the, the kind of like folklore stories and sightings, you, you learn how how super flawed perception is. Yeah, the interesting thing that come up with the with the Mothman is this idea of weapon focus, which is like when someone is mugged or whatever, and the, the person has a gun, and you're so focused on the gun that you like might, you might forget what color shirt the guy had on. And so people said that, you know, if, if the witnesses are super focused on the Mothman's eyes, that might be why they can't remember other details about the creature, like like what its face looked like or what its, uh, what its feet look like, <laughs> things like that. And and as they say, if you've misjudged the distance, then you've misjudged the size. So that's yep. true. As, as we were talking before about leading questions, if someone's like, uh, you know, what color hat did the person have on? They'll remember the person had a hat on, you know, just, just by that little suggestion that could make them remember a hat that the, the you know suspect wasn't wearing. But yeah, that's just an example of the, the flawed nature of, of perception and witness testimony. You know, witness testimony is, is very flawed, which is why another reason why I, I view this stuff more as, as folklore. It, it almost seems like you need like a team of a lot of different people, like a lot of like a multidiscipline study of like you got to have the journalist who can tell the story. You got to have the folklorist or the interviewer who can like collect the story properly. And, you know, uh, and you have like guys like a scientist and a psychologist and all kinds of things. If you had like a you know, a crack team of like all those di different studies or all those different fields of research, you know, they, they could really take a look at this stuff in a, an interesting way and kind of figure it all out. I think the main one would probably be the folklorist and the psychologist, because I, I, I lean more towards this having more to do with the mind than it does to do with, you know, the, the biological reality a lot, a lot of the times. Sure. Yeah. And that's exactly the truth is when it comes to collecting this information, these stories and this data, that is something that is going to be at the forefront. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things at play here and there's a lot of moving pieces, ethical side of everything and taking care and making sure that there's empathy put into this, but also because we don't want to be just a cold heart you know, scientific place because these stories, these entities, these encounters can really affect people in very negative ways. And that is something that we want to try to help demystify. It's something that we want to try to help these people, you know, if they need support in different ways, help people understand that if they have this encounter, that they have this story they shouldn't be ashamed i guess we could talk about skepticism now that, that that would be a topic to discuss skepticism and how we apply that to the paranormal and how your organization would apply that to uh, monsters and, and creatures and such things these, these sort of reports i know that we are both on the more skeptical side i would like to kind of put it in the ground that when it comes to the organization we wouldn't want to base it in pure skepticism or pure belief to try to be as non-biased as possible. However, with the understanding that people will always have a way that they believe in it, no matter what we do say or try to operate, utilizing that with that understanding that everyone is an individual and they have that right to either full-heartedly believe in Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, or they completely don't believe in this kind of idea. I would want to cultivate a, a breeding ground of ideas 
collaboration between everyone. I feel as though that a lot of people see, or they get this idea, this notion that believers and skeptics are at odds, and you know the skeptics are just you know the sticks in the mud that don't want to admit to anything, and we want to just disprove everything, and we want to push away everything, and mm. we're trying to keep everything away from people. But that's not it. That's not where I come from. We wouldn't be doing this, and we wouldn't be looking into this if we didn't find it to be interesting. The idea that you get like slotted into either or camp, I definitely uh, understand that, to experience that kind of thing, where if you are agnostic or impartial, if you enjoy the story or enjoy the material, but you're not a believer nor a disbeliever, uh, you know, the people who believe, they're going to call you a debunker. They're going to say that you're, you know, as you said, a, a stick in the mud or a killjoy. And the people who are not believers, they'll, they'll tell you that you're, they're wasting your time because you're daring to take interest in this material or daring to, to take it in any way seriously. They'll, they'll say that you're either a believer or that you're wasting your time. So, yeah, I understand that, that dichotomy there. That is a frustrating thing. Yeah, completely. So when, when it comes to, like, debunking, I think that, you know, when you interview the person, of course, you just collect the data and you don't, you're impartial and, and you, you just take that view to it. But I think afterwards, I think it's fair to see if the sighting holds up to scrutiny, to, to apply critical thinking to it, and kind of throw everything you have at it, trying to, to debunk it, not in like a harsh way or in a, you know, not in like a personal way or in a dismissive way or in a way where it's super biased and it's clear that you are just trying to explain it away, but to try to, you know, in a very honest way, see if there's any holes in the story that would make it to where this couldn't have happened. Not ever something like, oh, they couldn't have saw Sasquatch because Sasquatch don't exist. That's not the proper way of doing that. But if they say, I saw a Sasquatch on this day and this time, and then like somehow there was footage of them, they went on vacation, they were in a different state at the time. And, you know, so they couldn't have been where they say they were to, to see the Sasquatch, right? Like that's critical thinking. That's an example of something, you know, naturally just falling apart and being, you know, debunked in a way that really doesn't have anything to do with paranormal claims or if creatures exist or something like that, you know, that kind of thing. Or if, if they lie about their profession, if they say they're a police officer and they're not. Or if they lie about something like that that is like, well, if we're going to lie about this, then that, that casts a lot of doubt on their, their Sasquatch sighting, you know what I mean? So I think it's fair to apply critical thinking. The main criticism I have I see of a lot of the big debunking skeptics is they turn around and make a positive claim. You mentioned Joe Nichols. He, to me, he is the, the ultimate example of someone who is needlessly making a positive claim. Because when someone says they saw something like a Sasquatch, all you have to do is, if you, if you don't want to engage with it, all you have to do is doubt it and say, well, there's no evidence. And then you can, you can say, okay, there's no evidence. There you go. But if you say, you didn't see a Sasquatch, what you actually saw was this other thing. You didn't see a Mothman, you saw a, a barred owl you've now made a, a positive claim. And your positive claim doesn't have any evidence either. So that is a needless thing to do. You know, like they went to Robert Smith of West Virginia University and asked him what he thought the Mothman was. And he went back and said it was a sandhill crane. And they, they published that in the newspaper. And I, I have a feeling that he just pulled up uh, a zoology book, flipped through, found the first large bird that had red under its eyes and said, there you go. So I don't think that, that you need to make a positive claim. And I think that's also very reductive because Mothman sightings go far beyond just someone saw a bird, you know? Like there are people who said they saw Mothman in their house and all kinds of different, like really odd things with Mothman. So it goes beyond that. But yeah, that, that's my main criticism of debunkers is when, when they make a positive claim. So yeah, feel free to respond to any of that. I completely agree with you is that, that you know, that researcher, that individual was not there at that moment of time. So there's no possible way that they could have known. I, I feel as though that there are issues on both sides of the fence when it comes to the believers and, you know, the skeptics as well. One example that comes to mind is some of the things that people throw out there can actually be just as ridiculous as, as the paranormal claim. The Grafton Monster of 1964, it was like this white obstruction that was seen in the road in near Grafton, West Virginia. And it was like a, a seal-skinned monster, supposedly, seen by newspaper reporter Robert Cockrell. And it was dismissed by the newspapers as someone with a handcart pushing a bathtub down the street. And that someone saw that and that that was the reflective, like, 
of of someone with a bathtub on a hand cart. And so that's that's like a very very bizarre and specific claim. And the other one was that it was an escaped polar bear, which is also an absurd claim. Like that's like that's an absurd positive claim that you then have to prove. And if you can't prove it, well then your story is no better. You know, obviously not saying that it therefore must be a steel skinned monster, but a, a polar bear is is not a good way to debunk that story. So it seems like sometimes in the effort to to debunk something or say that it's not that, to come up with like a, a more logical explanation, sometimes what they come up with is like is just as absurd and just as, you know, unprovable. Another practice I think is important is there was a a Fordian who is a famous writer of like pulp novels. He wrote the, the Shadow. He was into like illusion, like stage magician stuff. And he had this concept of like what what you call housekeeping, which is debunking things, like pretty much going out and trying to debunk things as much as possible, kind of like James Randi or something like that, even when you're someone who is on the side of the paranormal or someone who is interested in the material. Uh, I think he was a believer in, in paranormal phenomena, but he was trying to debunk as much of it as he could in an effort of like housekeeping, of you know making sure that we get rid of all the, the fakes and the hoaxers and all that sort of thing. And so... I can really see that kind of thing. I think that actually is the way to go about it is to try to get rid of the stuff that's, you know, low quality or that's fake or hoaxes, that kind of stuff, you know, not because you don't like the paranormal, but because you do like the paranormal, because you want it to be high quality. And so I like that kind of approach, the, the housekeeping approach, because you do see people sometimes who will prop up or perpetuate something that's provably a hoax just because it suits to their goals or their ideologies. And I think it's better to you know, get rid of that stuff because you don't want a sighting that's provably fake. You want the high quality stuff. If you're on the side of these stories, you want the, the best stuff to be out there. And, you know, not saying you can't enjoy hoaxes in their own right as like a fun story. You know, they have to be labeled properly. If it's labeled properly, you can enjoy a hoax or you can even learn from a hoax and say, okay, this is how a hoax is done or this is how people have done hoaxes in the past and what they've done. People did like a fake UFO photo and then you could look at that and it can maybe help you determine future fake UFO photos or just be a fun story of some, some scoundrel who did something and tricked people. But yeah, I think that the housekeeping thing is... is a good idea. And, and the reason he was so able to do that kind of thing is because much like researcher John Keel, author of the Mothman Prophecies, he was uh, you know, a stage illusionist. So he was, he knew how to look for deception in that way because he was trained about like, you know, misdirection and all that kind of thing. And so he was able to look and see uh, how people were lying or how people were being deceptive. And, you know, that goes way back to like Harry Houdini, who was debunking the spiritualists and the, the seance practitioners who were fakes and frauds and hoaxers. As long as it's not something so like that strikes me as kind of superficial, like Joe Nichols, who goes and says that you know, there there is no Mothman or there is no we shouldn't take these stories seriously because, you know, the barred owl thing like that. That seems dismissive and kind of a very superficial analysis. So there's, there's a place for debunking. There's a place for, for that sort of thing. And, and surely critical thinking needs to be applied. You can't just let the story sit there unchallenged. You do have to apply a little bit of critical thinking, even if you're viewing it as just folklore, because you can't say, oh, well, it's just folklore. Who cares if there's like a glaring thing that shows that the story is just like completely like disproven as, as I said, like the example, which is a more human example of like the person wasn't there at the time, like provably so. And so they couldn't have possibly seen it or, or something like that. You know, that's exactly true because we do have stories and legends such as like the the surgeon photo from for the Loch Ness monster mm. is that was the best evidence that we had at that time you know when that was taken and everyone was you know shocked about it i i remember when i first saw that photo i was like oh my god it's real and then over time you know we've got people who come to the forefront and confess that you know well it wasn't true because you know a friend and i we went out and made this like toy submarine that had it and you also have supporting evidence too because a lot of people were saying like it's a plesiosaur but then we start finding out that when we take a harder look into it and the bones that the plesiosaur has left over time that the bones don't quite interlock that way to allow it that kind of goose like you know swan kind of figure it would be more like a tree trunk and it would only have a very limited range so we would have to kind of ding that instance for points on on this cred score but it is one of those things that 
is always going to be evolving until we find something that's concrete and there. These stories and these kind of witnesses, these pictures, these photos, these videos and everything kind of will have to stand the, the, the test of time because things do evolve, our knowledge and everything becomes greater. We ultimately don't know until we are given more information. Yeah, with, with the surgeon's photo, it, that's like a learning process, like a fun story to, to show how these sort of things are done. Of course, even after it was like, well, I would think it's pretty provably debunked, there are still people who would cling to that and say, no, it's actually a photo of the Loch Ness Monster. So that's the thing I, I want to avoid is when something is provably debunked or disproven that people would still like cling to it because it fits to their narrative. And I don't like that sort of thing. But right. yeah, one thing I wanted to bring up about the Loch Ness Monster really quick is that they did like a, a DNA test of the loch and saw like the, they tested different fish and stuff like that to see if they could determine if there was any indication of like, you know, a living dinosaur or some kind of, you know, in relation to the, the fish living there and that sort of thing. And they, they come up with with no DNA, no, no concept that there would be because, you know, you can you can tell based on the environment uh, what kind of animals live in in the loch there by doing the DNA testing and stuff like that. And. They come up with like, yeah, there's there's no nothing in there that would indicate the existence of a dinosaur or a plesiosaur or anything like that. You know what I mean? So I, I would yeah. think that the Loch Ness monster is more folkloric, and the sightings are are not of a flesh and blood creature. Right. No. Well, I'll be honest with you that it it does break my heart to know that, just because uh, I think that's actually one of my favorite stories is the Loch Ness monster and like finding a real life dinosaur. That oh, that would be a dream, right? But <laughs> it. it it's kind of sad. Well, they just had that exp expedition where they were calling all the, you know, Nessie hunters and, you know, Loch Ness monster hunters or people who are interested in this to have a giant search party. And to my, you know, to my knowledge, they haven't been able to prove anything. So it, I, I feel as though that it kind of ultimately disproves the Loch Ness monster, you know, but I, I, you know, I can't say definitively you know and i don't feel as though that it's just such an interesting legend and i i do feel as though that me personally as much as i'd like it to be real i i it does kind of have to fall into the realm of like fantasy and legend and lore folklore or, or paranormal manifestation i'm very non-biased when it comes to that sure so <laughs> if that's what a person believes that's what they believe or, or just think it's possible Ultimately, uh, when it comes to certain things, like with the lock, you can kind of determine, you know, scientifically, like what's in there. But other things are less, maybe you could say Sasquatch is, is less provable in that way. For me, the fact that there's never been any body or DNA or, or bones kind of like tells me something. But you could say that that's less provable or unprovable. So a lot of stuff like paranormal claims ultimately come down to being an uh, unfalsifiable hypothesis, which is something that cannot be proven nor disproven. As long as the person is a real person and they're not lying about like who they are and they went to a location and they actually did go there and all that sort of thing, you know, if they say they saw something, you know, and they don't have a photo of it, no one else was there, you can't um, disprove it. There's not, it's not provable or, or disprovable. So a lot of paranormal claims of any kind fall into that realm of just unfalsifiable hypothesis. And that's really not something you can put like a, a credibility rating on. It's just it's just a, a witness testimony. It's just like a claim that someone made. But as I, as you said before, there there are factors you could apply. Like, were there multiple witnesses? You know, has, has their story been consistent? Uh, th things like that. But ultimately, you do run into just that final brick wall there of like, well, it's not something that can be proven. Uh, you know, can't be disproven. You know, unless it is something that's exposed to be a hoax in some other way. But it's something that's not provable or or disprovable at, at the moment. One thing I was going to say, one more thing about uh, interviewing witnesses. What I, I would do with interviewing witnesses is, is take a, an agnostic approach, approach it more like a folklorist or like a, a sociologist or an anthropologist. You know, when it comes to if, if you are someone who does not believe in the paranormal, I don't think that should matter at all. I think it's perfectly fine that, as long as you stress to them that you find their story important, that you think it's important to collect their story, that the, the data is, is important. As long as you stress the, you know, the seriousness of that, I think that can can put them at ease, you know, as long as they, they understand that, you know, that you think what they went through is something serious, that their experience they had, whether it is, if it's just something that's real to them, either way, just the fact that you're taking it serious and that you care about the effects that it has on them or the effects it has on society, 
or, or things like that. I think that's enough to, to hear them out and that sort of thing. You know, if, if you approach it in a different way where, you, where you're overly critical or you're something like that, then that's that's no good. And, you know, sometimes I think maybe someone who believes in stories, like they, they prove, they show you that they believe in a Sasquatch, might uh, maybe have a more easy time interviewing. But I think it as long as you show that you take them seriously, that you're not making fun of them, that you, you know, take on board their concerns, then I think that's all you need to do in order to have a rapport with the witness in order to get the story or, or get the sighting or have them share the, the details with you. One one thing that has kind of been at the forefront is there's always been people that it really does affect their life. You know, in the in the case of Linda Scarberry, I, I do know that it affected her life very badly and poorly. And, uh, you know, I know that it from my research, it kind of probably wasn't the, the main thing, but like it destroyed her marriage. Uh, and these events can r have real effects on people. Whether what matters is the person that went through this is still a person who went through this. And understanding, again, kind of going back to safety and using empathy to employ the, this kind of data collecting research is vital because it, it is something that it really does affect people. People can have real trauma when it comes to these events. And that is something, my heart goes out to any person who has had a story like this and they've brought it to the table and it has affected them. I, I can't imagine what that's like and my heart goes out to them, but that does not mean that I still don't want to collect that story to research it and to look into it. Give a person a chance to explain their side of it and to explain their story and what happened to the events that happened to them. So the only thing I have left here are some critical points. If I discuss some things that are, that are a bit more critical of, of cryptozoology or some more uh, difficult questions. Are you, are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah, let's go for it. And some of these uh, are just like devil's advocate questions. Okay, <laughs> so I think the number one would be, uh, would you consider cryptozoology to be a pseudoscience? Me personally, I don't consider cryptozoology to, to be a pseudoscience. Uh, and the reason being is because we do have creatures that do fall into the realm of cryptozoology, whether it due to be overhunting issues or whether it being we've got the body of a creature, but we just don't see any of them around. And so I feel as though that it's kind of a mislabel, but at the end of the day, you know, we can only do our best to continue researching and looking into these different creatures. Mm -hmm. I know that cryptozoologists often bring up like the giant squid and stuff like that, but those kind of discoveries were made by, by people who weren't cryptozoologists. So it's, it's like kind of claiming something that wasn't actually part of, of that study. Right. And that's actually monumental. We, you know, I feel as though that when you have people that are eager to find out what something is, they are quick to attribute it to what they've been hearing or what they've been seeing in the news. And we, we see this happen with flaps of sightings. And um, a flap is just where one story gets published and then you have a whole lot of other people going out looking for it and they see sightings and kind of a domino effect and that's what we would want to try and eliminate whether it in cryptozoology doesn't have to be about specifically the animal that would be kind of up to the zoologist but i feel as though that cryptozoology can be pulled back into the fact that we are looking for biological entities that you know we can have proof of and that we can kind of continue to push that into zoology and using that as a springboard for the this foundation. Mm -hmm. I, I want to point out that um, the term flap comes from the UFO research field. So, so I find it interesting to, to hear that term being used for, for cryptozoology. I, I mean, so, and admittedly, I'm kind of pulling that from Joe Nickel a little bit because he uses that term uh, when talking about Mothman specifically. And that that's actually... What, where I heard that first, but you're right, is that like, you know, it, I feel so that it does happen with other 
kind of surrounding entities that may be tangential to it where you know whether it be a ufo mothman or in people like injury cold and things of that nature hmm. interesting yeah because some of those entities are like ufo entities like mothman sometimes was called the ufo bird and you know you think of like the kentucky yeah. goblins kentucky goblins are often some people might consider that a cryptid but to me, that's like a UFO entity because it, it relates. To, the story is about like a flying saucer that like that someone sees that then has these little goblin creatures. Plenty of those things, you know, like for example, the Flatwoods monster. Uh, that's a, a famous UFO case, but some people might call uh, Braxy. They might call that a cryptid, or the Kentucky Goblins or cryptids or something like that. So th those are. It seems like sometimes cryptozoology kind of takes UFO lore, like UFO creatures, and then labels those now as cryptid, even though there's like flying saucers in those stories or like lights in the sky and things that are like that originating from the ufo field from the ufo movement like the kentucky goblins was reported as a ufo sighting or as a ufo encounter like a close encounter of the third kind because there was like a saucer right and like the the flatwoods monster has like a light in the sky yeah so the, these are ufo cases they're, they're you know they were already talked about in the 50s and stuff you know like even before the label of, of cryptozoology was super popular which like came about a little bit later, as I, as I said, in the 80s with that um, society that was set up. So so just the origin of that is is UFO, but then is people sometimes call those cryptids now. One, th one more thing I'll point out about Ivan Sanderson is alongside him being a Fordian, he also did have his interest in UFOs. He wrote a book about, uh, quote unquote, the, the reality of underwater UFOs. And um, he also was one of the researchers on scene interviewing the witnesses of the Flatwoods monster back in 1952. And that's a, a big UFO story. So there, there is a lot of crossover, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the actual sightings, I'm talking about like in terms of the literature and of the culture with cryptozoology and the UFO movement. Yeah, I, and that, I mean, that's actually pretty interesting. I did, he wrote a book about the possibility of underwater UFOs. The, the quote unquote reality. <laughs> Oh, okay. That's, My bad. That's, that's, uh, that's the title. That's pretty interesting. Invisible Residence, The Reality of Underwater UFOs by Ivan T. Sanderson, 1970. That's interesting. I, I, I'll have to look into that a little bit. Yeah, they're, they're sometimes called uh, USOs, such as uh, Unidentified Submerged Object. So yeah, that is a thing. Oh, interesting. Okay. Have you researched much about Ivan Sanderson? Admittedly, I have not. Um, I, I know that when it comes, it, it, that's one thing that I will personally say is that I find it fascinating people like yourself that can like pull names and dates out of their back pocket. Uh, when it comes to that, I've got a very hard time with it. But um, yeah, it's something that um, I really, you know, would like to learn more about. But that, you know, these these topics can be kind of a rabbit hole all in it, in it of itself so it's like you can just keep going and going further ivan t sanderson is one of the people who really kind of popularize uh you know the abominable snowman lore in in america with his book abominable snowman legend come to life 1961 okay i know who you're talking about now i okay yep he, he is the one who coined the term cryptozoology and he did articles about bigfoot and that started popping off really big in like the late 50s and that actually inspired uh roger patterson to get involved into the field when he read Ivan T. Sanderson's article about the Abominable Snowman of America, and he started the club, the Abominable Snowman of America Club. So, yeah, so very, very influential figure there, you know, because you wouldn't have had that, uh, you know, Patterson Gimlin film without that, probably. I mean, you're absolutely right on that. And, uh, yeah, that it, it's been pretty influential. I know a lot of people will kind of take that and run with it. Like, I'm, I must have watched that same footage, like, a million times but it's something that like always gets brought up if whenever you go to like a bigfoot convention or when you start talking about bigfoot it's usually the forefront of every discussion so it's pretty interesting okay that brings to mind a question okay so i, I assume that what you're going to do with your your organization is that witnesses who have sightings could come to you and then a field agent or someone will interview them so if someone came to you and they were like uh valerie i saw a Sasquatch, and as the Sasquatch was walking away, I looked up in the distance and I saw a silver flying saucer overhead. Would you would you take down that story? Would you just mark down the Sasquatch, or would you write down the part about the saucer? 
Oh, you're splitting hairs now. I see. <laughs> um, so I, I I feel as though that it'd be worth documenting that story, but we wouldn't want to kind of do a deeper dive into the saucer part. Into we would still make note of it, we'd still acknowledge it, but it's not something that would be at the forefront. The forefront would obviously be the living creature itself. And I know that that kind of brings up the question of like, well, maybe the saucer is a creature, you know, things of that nature. But I feel so at the forefront of it, we would still have to try to do our best to define the stories at some point because it can kind of go into one certain direction or another, but we would want to try to keep people on track as best as we could. Okay. Because there's, you know, sometimes there is crossover. There is like, you know, as we see with Mothman, you have all kinds of different paranormal stuff just crossing over. And, you know, they call that high strangeness, these kind of concepts. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, and I completely agree with you on that. It's not something that is an easy thing to approach, but it's something that we would definitely have to kind of handle delicately because we okay. we wouldn't want to disengage from that story, but we would probably want to do a little bit more research and try to focus on the things that we could prove, the things that we would want to pull back a little bit because it, it could go into a completely different direction, you know, and it really depends on what that person focused on. So it, it would... Mm. It would it would take some time some time to kind of see how we want to approach that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this is why I tend to advocate for a more intersectional approach, like for societies to be like general anomalous phenomena stuff like that, so that it, it can cover like all the different uh, ins and outs and all the different weird things that kind of goes on with some of these sightings. Because you know, if you're just focused on just the UFO or just the Sasquatch, then you know you might be missing some of the story. Like someone could tell a story to you and you focus on the Sasquatch, they'll tell the same story to a UFO organization and they'll focus on just the UFO, you know what I mean? Right. No, and that that's something that we would kind of have to try to work with and try to kind of whittle down, you know, the process of how we want to investigate that and what angle we want to approach when looking into it a little bit further. Okay. So, so what if someone comes to you and they say, I saw a Sasquatch, it was glowing a yellow color. Its eyes were, were blazing with fire. Uh, it was holding a glowing orb in its hand. There was a flying saucer above head. And afterwards, my home was haunted. And the men in black visited my house. What would you say? Well, what would you do? I don't think I'm quit for that one. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's something that I'm positive that does happen. I'm, I'm positive that there are experiences out there like that. When it comes to, I mean, at the end of the day, it would be something that, like, as long as it had a cryptozoological animal, and try to help people understand that that's the actual focus. The research is here to try and educate people about these creatures. Like, that's the forefront here. Because, you know, we could easily go into very tangential things and things that are so far off the beaten path. And I feel as though that there has to be a stopping point at some area and trying to whittle that down as much as we can is and trying to help people understand that it's not about the research about the extenuating factors that happened. Like, say you got sick three weeks later from this encounter and you had something called monster sickness and, you know, everything like that. Those are kind of the the reverb effect from that story. It would be based on that specific story with the the cryptid at the forefront of the story. Okay then. So and the the other question I guess or continuing this around the same theme is uh how absurd is is too absurd? What if someone says they saw atmospheric jellyfish, like a giant jellyfish in the sky? Or they saw a dragon. I've heard about those. Yes. Yeah and I've heard about that, um, and it really is hard to say. I I will be honest with you on that, and that is something that is going to have to be a little bit looked under the microscope to see where we want to like draw that line. 
when it comes to atmospheric jellyfish, in fact, I think there was a movie about that recently that I saw. Uh, essentially, we would want a little bit more kind of focus on the creature itself. A dragon is something that I, I feel as though that could completely qualify for it. When it comes to a giant atmospheric jellyfish, that's where it's getting into like UFO paranormal territory. But, you know, I, I'm not going to be one to say that we should throw it out immediately, but it's something that we would just need to look closer into and to see how much reality could be based within that. Because we could start going down paths where, you know, we're talking about something that happened under the effects of like psychedelics or something, you know, and it's like, we could always keep leading it towards one way, or it could still be related to something else and go down that path. And, you know, just trying to pull it back to the bare basics and try to see like what the fundamentals are and build our way up from there, because we can only use and utilize the things that we can tangibly prove. And, using those stories, we would have to realize that is that a creature that we could compare to a dog, a cat, something that, you know, is is kind of in that realm mm -hmm. and work work our way up from there. Because we I mean, we could start going down the semantics and trying to figure that out all day. But I think at the end of the day, we would just want to try to fo help people focus on the research aspect and the the biological aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So, so you think that that your organization would focus more strictly on zoological or things that are more likely to be real world flesh and blood animals? Correct. Yep. Okay, but what what is the the process? Do you if someone brings you a story, do you still record it and investigate it, and then perhaps investigate it with more scrutiny if it's more absurd, or what do you think? I feel as though that that would kind of start to be classified under the, the CRED report. Some of it may be non-applicable to the, the organization. And that's something that after we took the story, we would have to then see where that story belongs, if it does have a place in the organization, or if we want to pass it off to a different organization, one that specifically goes around UFOs or one that specifically goes under paranormal research, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's cool. If you, you know, would reach out to other people and say, okay, I think you should go here instead or tell the story to someone else instead, that that would be at least right. pretty cool, you know, better than some of the organizations of the past, like, like APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, they, they always turned away contactees, like people who claim that they were in contact with aliens. They always thought that was too far. And so they just didn't, they didn't cover those stories. And so that, that's an example of that sort of thing. And then there were people who uh, you know, welcome in the contactees and publish their books for them and stuff like that. So there, there's sometimes a line about like what's too absurd or what's too far. And sometimes, like way back in the day, there were UFO societies that didn't want to hear about close encounters of the third kind, meaning they didn't want to hear about any story where it wasn't just a light in the sky or it wasn't just a saucer. They they want to hear about like reportedly saw aliens, you know. So you know, it's like where it's always like where do you draw the line? Where, where, where what's what's too absurd? But yeah, it's interesting. Do you think your your cred rating would have like a, a factor for absurdity or for fancifulness? You know, like not how many witnesses there are or et cetera, et cetera, but just like because it's so strange. Like I, I saw my neighbor transform into a werewolf before my very eyes, like you know, that kind of story. I feel so that I would actually fall a little bit more under like witchcraft or Wiccan lore or something of that nature. I'm not too, I'm not that knowledgeable about werewolves and things of that nature but uh when it comes to you know i i do know that there's people out there that who actually believe in that um but i feel as though that that would be better handled by someone not in the organization and it, it would probably be a better you know idea for some other researching organization but yeah it's it's definitely something that we would kind of have to kind of wheel down and try to f see what kind of bubbles up from those experiences. And that's a part of the learning process. That's a part of the, the honing and research process. Yeah. So, so I don't, I don't want to make the mistake of uh, continuing to ask questions about like this sort of stuff as if it's already set up. So I should uh, clarify once again, that this is still like a hypothetical 
organization. It's still like an idea that we're, we're talking about that's still in like its early stages. So there's like a lot of stuff to still work out and figure out and stuff like that. But yeah, so just, just some questions I was thinking about, like when you, when you set up a thing and you ask for sightings, you will, you'll get some strange, some strange stuff if you actually get some sightings. Oh yeah. Like, and I, that's something that I've always prepared to encounter and it, it, these are legitimate questions and they're, you know, they're, very on point to you know what we want to look into and how we want to investigate them and it's something that does need to be asked and needs to be talked about definitely so it, do you think that there should be like a a cred factor for just absurdity if it's something that's just so colorful i think the cred factor really would depend upon how not legitimate it is because it's still legitimate sighting but essentially like the cred factor is there to increase the the reliability of the story and how it happened, whether it starts turning into a fantastical, you know, fairy tale. You know, th there's that story about fairies, and you know, way back when there was a, those pictures. I forget the details of that, but if someone came to us with that story, we would have to turn that one down just because that's not something that we would want to focus in on or, you know, it admittedly does kind of fall within the realm of the fantastic purview. But I, you know, it, I know it's hard to kind of turn down some of these stories with people who are emphatic that they're, that they're legit stories. And I would just have to inform that individual that I don't believe that it is indeed a good fit for the organization. I think you were talking about the Cottingley fairies, the the ones with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The cutouts of the fairies, yeah. and they just took pictures of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess because my tastes are more interconnected or more uh, multidisciplinary or intersectional, that I would not take the same tactic, especially because I kind of like the more absurd stuff. And so for, for my kind of view, as long as it's not something that can be directly disproven, it happens to be fanciful. If someone says they saw like a, you know, atmospheric jellyfish or something and it was glowing different colors and stuff like a rainbow, then, you know, I wouldn't think that that necessarily makes it less likely than someone seeing like a flesh and blood Sasquatch. As long as they're, they, them themselves holds up, all the material factors kind of hold up of like, okay, this person is real and actually were there and there's nothing there's nothing like specifically rotten about the story that other than the the fancifulness of the the entity you know i i don't think that would factor in unless it was like as, as we said before like proven in some other way different researchers and where they draw the line and what they are willing to entertain or to record because like i said with with this stuff i view as folklore i just enjoy the storytelling i'm not gonna i, I would always report on it as like this is a reported sighting an alleged sighting a, a supposed sighting I wouldn't say, like, no, this person definitely saw these giant jellyfish, you know. Okay, back to the, the critical critical stuff. What would you say to just the point that because this is witness testimony, it shouldn't be called science or zoology or anything like that because it's just reporting on sightings that people have seen so that it's, it's, it should be more akin to folklore and shouldn't be in the same category as zoology? So... Let me try to see what you're I'm, – I'm sorry. I'm just trying to understand what you're actually asking. Um, I guess the, the criticisms that like a hardcore zoologist would, would pose to cryptozoology, basically saying there's no hard evidence for a Sasquatch or a dogman, uh, any other such creature or monster. So if they say, okay, there's no hard evidence for this, and what you have is witness testimony, which is unreliable – and it's considered like anecdotal evidence and therefore kind of like mm -hmm. invalid. Like what would your reply to that sort of thing be? That zoology says like, no, this, this is not legitimate zoology because the organization is called CRED, right? So if, if they're like, well, this is not legitimate zoology because it's based on witness testimony and not hard evidence. Okay, I see what you mean. So the process that we're trying to do is we are not trying to emulate ourselves against zoology. We are trying to emulate ourselves against this type of investigation, these types of entities, so we can push these creatures into zoology. Because once we are actually able to discover something, if that's applicable, then we could, at that point, turn that information, that cryptid, into zoology, and then it would fall under that purview. And so... I. Again, cryptozoology can be pretty nebulous in what we're 
actually trying to study here and try to look at at the core value and the core of the organization would be to help research, to look into, to investigate these animals. And if there happened to be something that would come to the forefront, then that's when we would have to take the reins off. Like if we, for instance, were able to have someone discover Bigfoot, we then would have to take that entity, that creature, and give it to zoology because it, at that point in time, is no longer something that is hidden at that point. And that's when we would want the actual professionals to take, take it from that point. Not to say that we're not professionals, but people who are able to look into the biology of it. That's not what the organization would be about is not to get into the biology of it, but to have the proper tools, to have the proper information and education to go out and study these creatures at best and try to produce real creatures at best, like to really discover them and to find methods of how to either lore or obtain one of these creatures in some fashion and then turn it over to the other professionals that are able to kind of complete that circle and get it into zoology or the field of study where it belongs. Hmm. So, so do you think then it's fair to say that the cryptozoology is, is not zoology? Cryptozoology is, I feel so that the reason why Zoology kind of is in that word is just because of how it was coined. But at the end of the day, cryptozoology is still trying to find hidden animals. Once you basically unhide it, it kind of falls outside that purview of cryptozoology, but it's still an exciting endeavor nonetheless. Okay. So so you were kind of saying that it's it's called zoology just because it relates to animals. Right. In like in like a colloquial way. Sure. Okay, which is another point of why I'm like, I don't think it should be called that, you know? Um, yeah. Okay, so so would you then say, this, if you're saying that it's not quite a science, wouldn't it then therefore be fair to say that it's a pseudoscience? No, I don't believe so at all. I believe that pseudoscience is essentially when you, when you try to take things that, trying to make things out of nothing, essentially, and then try to use science to explain it, whereas... I feel as though that if this is more revolving around the idea of research and education and try to do proper treatment of these cryptids or these entity these animals and try to obtain safely obtain one or safely research them in a very ethical fashion. Okay. Well you could say that you're using zoology to explain folklore, like Sasquatch lore, saying, you know, natives and, and people in general have seen these ape creatures and or, you know, have stories about ape creatures in the woods. And then you're using zoology, which is like a, a science, to explain this folklore. So isn't that kind of the same thing? No, because I've, I've again, we're, we're kind of getting into the, the weeds of things in like nomenclature. And I feel as though that it's more based around trying to safely research these creatures and try to see what discoveries we can out there. Whereas we're not trying to create something from nothing. We've heard reports of this creature being out there, so we go out and look for it. That's not necessarily trying to produce results out of nothing. That's something that there's undiscovered animals, you know, in the bottom of the ocean. And I'm positive that there's different species out there. And using the correct tools and information to locate and obtain or to turn over or to discover these other species, creatures, or entities. I don't believe that it's at any point in time we're trying to create something from nothing. Oh, okay. Fair enough. So if we didn't use the, the word cryptozoology, do you have another name that you might come up with or recommend that you think would be something else that they could call it instead of a cryptozoology? It's kind of a, a funny thing to think about. I couldn't come up with anything off the top of my head. I'd have to yeah. think about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would be cool because, as, as I said, I'm not, I'm not really big on, on those words. I can't, I can't think of anything either other than just, you know, like monster researchers or monster research. I don't know. It takes some... Mess around with some Latin for a bit, come up with something like monstro yeah. 
monstro studious something 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 no i mean it it's a fair point i i get what you mean yeah okay so yeah that that's all i was saying so i get you one more thing then you said you want to attract scientists and that might be a bit of an uphill battle so how, how do you plan to to go about that kind of thing try to attract scientists to something that is going to be based in cryptozoology and that's part of what we would want the organization to do as well is to try to show that there is validity in trying to research and to work with these other scholars essentially it would be difficult to start out with because a lot of people do kind of you know throw this into the realms of you know of a pseudoscience and i agree that their criticisms are absolutely you know there i i get it i i totally understand it but i want them to understand that we want to if and when something is discovered we'd want to hand it over to them at that point in time essentially what it boils down to is that it would be a you know research education initiative we would use these methods to try and locate things that would help advance you know areas like zoology i get it i totally get it that there are things that we see out there that kind of get into the more fantastic side of things. And we're trying to separate that. We're trying to sift that out so we can take a look at the hard, cold science fact and see what we can do from that point and try to base it off of that using real methods. But yeah, as you said, though, it's it's difficult to like go to like a scientist and, and say like, okay, we're going to be doing this, this thing about Sasquatch. You know, there are some scientists, you know, like the classic ones, like Grover Krantz and things like that, who were, you know, researchers of Sasquatch lore, who were scientists and studied like legitimate zoology and stuff like that. So it's a rare thing. I think a more modern example is, is uh, Jeff Meldrum. So there are some scientists oh. who look into Sasquatch, but it, it's a, uh, it's a difficult thing to attract scientists to, to that kind of feel or that kind of study. Right. And I, I think that just kind of is with the territory. And that's not something that I feel so that we would want other people to understand that we would look towards them to actually do the, you know, documenting of these creatures once we're able to provide something to document that we're able to hand it off to them and know the boundaries between where the research and the like hunting and gathering of information would stop and where we would have to at that point hand off the biological entity to those professionals that actually do that and it's kind of like you know trying to push that initiative and you're right it's very much an uphill battle. There are people that all, are always going to be, you know, a mocking kind of, you know, stance to it or, you know, kind of put it into the realm of, you know, not real or anything else like that. And that's fair. I get that. But it's not, it's not like once we are able to obtain something, we then do the research and we keep it as cryptozoology forever. You know, it's kind of like one of those things where once we understand what we have and we're able to provide a blueprint of how we're supposed to research it, then that's when we can, you know, try to find that entity. And then if and when we would able to are able to find anything, we would hand it off to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so from what I'm seeing, you're, you're talking about, you know, collecting stories and looking for data and then deferring the science and handing it over if need be to legitimate science and you know that's that seems cool that seems like a good thing but i i just think that the the zoology label that cryptozoology is stuck with kind of makes it seem like it's, it's trying to be something that it's not and it's kind of like an albatross around its neck and i think that's probably my main suggestion to, to any cryptozoologist or cryptozoology organization is that you know that that name because you know mainstream science will be like well we don't accept you or you know we don't see the credibility there so and i i mean i totally get it i i see where you're coming from um i'm just kind of working within the realm that i'm given i can't you know <laughs> i I'm, i can only do so much at one given time so mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And you, you know, I study this stuff and I collect sightings and you, you know where I'm coming from. Like, I, I don't think there's anything like I like that the concept of, of collecting sightings and data and all that sort of thing. Yeah, no, I totally get it. But yeah, what, what would you say, though, if you, you try to approach a zoologist and say, hey, we want to join our, our thing here and help us, like, you know, study this sort of thing. And they, they say, you know, OK, what's the thing? And you say, we're going to bring credibility to cryptozoology. What, what if they said that cryptozoology doesn't deserve credibility, right? Just from like what they've seen of it from what their experience with it and the, the books they've read, the material they've come across, that they say cryptozoology doesn't deserve credibility. What, what would the reply to that be? I, admittedly, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, I feel as though that I would have to point to other research that's been done, such as the coelacanth, such as the, the thylacane, and try to, you know, explain to them that these are things that are considered to be a part of cryptozoology and that we want to help to try to preserve and investigate any possible sightings so we could try to possibly look into these these creatures and try to do more research on, on these and hopefully produce something that they can look into, that they can, uh, you know, actually have to study. Mm. I get you. But you know, as I said before, some, uh, a lot of those big discoveries, like the giant squid and stuff like that, didn't come about from like cryptozoologists. They came about from biologists or other people who were studying this stuff that you know just came upon these discoveries. So I don't think we've had anything yet where it was people who are dedicated, who call themselves cryptozoologists, who go out there studying the stuff, and then they discover a new species or something like that. We've had new species discovered, you know, things that we thought were were fake or mythological, and then they were discovered, but they weren't discovered by people who called themselves cryptozoology. They're taken in as like, oh, this is an example of how cryptozoology works. But it's, you know, it's, we haven't had that thing yet, you know, maybe one day they'll, you know, <laughs> find the, the bones of a Sasquatch somewhere, and then you'll have your, your, your first thing there, your first like, yes, this is the first cryptozoology specific discovery of an undiscovered animal. Yeah, and... I mean, that's completely fair. I, I feel as though that it really would boil down to trying to understand that, you know, we're not trying to call ourselves cryptozoologists and go out there and, you know, be, you know, wearing a lab coat right next to them in, in that field of study. What we're trying to do is just bring that documentation and if there's any kind of creature, because if these animals actually exist, once we're able to find something, we can then hand off all that research and information to the zoologist. So I had one more thing here. Uh, I don't know if this is critical or not, but just considering it's it's a nonprofit, how does all that work? Like, how, how does the money work? How does the the organization of, of a nonprofit function? So a lot of it would be off based off of donations that would come in from other benefactors. Uh, and admittedly, this is where it starts to get a little bit into the gray area. I am not one person that deals a whole lot with like money and finances, and that's part of you know what I'm looking for assistance with and trying to get interest involved and try to bring people to the table that would actually be able to understand that portion because when it comes to the research and that perspective, that's something that I feel as though that I've done quite a bit of research. I've, you know, I've researched it since I was like super young. And that's something that I have a real core belief in. But when it comes to the actual like finances and everything, that's where it starts to get a little bit like nebulous for me. I admittedly, when it comes to that, that's more of like a bookkeeper question, I feel, than anything else. Well, that's that, that is that then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so when it comes to. You know, the collecting of stories and that sort of thing. I, I definitely think we're on the, the same page or the same team there when it comes to collecting stories that I consider, you know, modern American folklore and preserving of, of data of, of strange encounters and all that sort of thing. We're definitely on the same team there. We have we share the same goal. But when it comes to, you know, the ins and outs of, of cryptozoology and, and theorizing about what these things are, of course, there's differences there. But as I said before, the, the data is what's important. The theorizing is secondary. And, you know, what, what labels you ascribe to is also kind of secondary. It isn't that the main point, I think, is, is the data. And so we agree there. And so I think that your organization is a fascinating and interesting 
thing that you're you're going for there. You know, it's interesting to see someone try to do this and then have this idea. And I think that's that's cool that you're you're trying to do that. And you know, I think you got a good head on your shoulders. And so it'd be cool to see <laughs> what comes of this. I think you do a good job as the lead of a project. I think that'd be awesome to see. So yeah, so there's that. There, there's my my final thoughts on the matter. As I think that would that would be cool to see as you as the lead of some project. You know. Even if it's not this project, even if uh, you know you come up with a better idea, or you have some other project you think would be even greater than this. Whatever, whatever happens there, I think it would be cool to see you in, in, in the leadership position. So there, there you go. Well, thank you. I I do appreciate it. Like, and that's one thing is that I I welcome this information, the criticism, and you know because it really does kind of help hammer out those ideas to try to figure out where things should be going and be in the forefront of. Admittedly, I know that over the years people have asked me to write books, and I've never been one to like be in that perspective. Um, I feel as though that I would have very bad discipline <laughs> issues when it comes to actually writing a book. I, I admittedly, it's something I should kind of sit down and do a little bit more of, and try to work all this. But I, you know, I'm just doing the best with what I can and just got to keep moving forward. It's something that I've always been very passionate about cryptozoology. It's something that has always interested me. And it's something that I feel as though that should be more talked about and things that we should look into a little bit further and not dismissed into the side of pseudoscience or what have you. It's, it's something that is a personal interest of mine and yeah i just want to i would love to be in the field and working in it but i do understand that there are those criticisms especially when you start getting into folklore and everything else and that's something that i completely acknowledge and you know it's just trying to figure out the best path to move forward from that point yeah a point that i that i kind of glossed over or didn't have much time to mention there is uh, i feel like sometimes cryptozoology can kind of like miss the magic of folklore, putting things into biological boxes, you can kind of miss how things are, are storytelling, you know, like if like a, a local a local legend has a lot of like mysticalness to it, a uh, cryptozoologist would come along and only see the, the flesh and blood uh, material animal behind it as opposed and kind of miss the, the forest of the trees in, in that regard. So that's that's a another criticism I have sometimes of cryptozoology is, you know, missing the, the magic of the storytelling that is kind of integral. It's like uh, if you heard Little Red Riding Hood and you walked away saying that it's something must be some undiscovered bipedal humanoid wolf, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Right. Now, and, and I mean, certainly it, it really depends on where you fall when it comes to what like perspective you want to take on it. And I think that ultimately that's what it could be attributed to. But I feel as though that there's validity here. So I, I completely understand your perspective on it. It's just that, you know try to figure out where exactly research, you know, where it should be placed. And that's, you know, what I'm trying to draw out that framework for. So, yeah, I like, I like the idea of, of the field agents, and I like the idea of the, the cred rating. I think that's, that, that's a really interesting idea there. I think that if that's done right, that could be really cool, the, the cred rating thing. Yeah. So I think we've discussed all there is to discuss there. Okay, so best of luck with your organization there and with your research in general. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me about it. I really do appreciate it. I love all your work, and it's been really fascinating to see what endeavors you go down, and I appreciate you having me here, and yeah, hopefully we can kind of keep moving forward with this. Okay, so thanks for watching, and Mountaineers are always free.